ladies and gentlemen, the uh, unstoppable and unflappable John O'Bacon, who uh, has steered many of us through some tricky waters and uh, continues to be an absolute, uh, an, an, an absolute beacon, uh, as well as a bacon, in the, uh, in the community. He's known for his taste in many things, including footwear. So uh, those of you who haven't rushed out to get this season's uh, fancy flip-flops, best you uh, get ahead of the queue. So 1004 LTS, what an unbelievable release. I get goose pimples thinking about it. It was an astonishing effort from an enormous number of people with a singular, singular vision, and the result was itself singular. So I think you all deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you very much for, uh, for what you did. Chris Kenyon, who, uh, who is charged with, uh, with helping the, the PC industry understand that there is, in fact, a powerful, compelling, easy-to-use alternative to Windows, and has been taking great leaps in that regard, um, has been heard in the city, uh, by which I mean Taipei, saying uh, that 1004 LTS is where stunning meets powerful. And uh, I think we absolutely live up to that. So well, well, well done. It, uh, it really was an extraordinary effort. Today, we start the process of honing down and focusing on what um, is going to go into the next release. The Maverick Meerkat is going to be a, uh, a punchy release. Uh, <clears throat> Lucid being an LTS, we had uh, a set of practices around how we merged. We had a set of uh, uh, practices around the iteration. We had a whole bunch of disciplines associated with making sure it would live up to the LTS moniker. Um, Maverick is all about laying the foundations for 1204 LTS for embracing new technologies and for moving really, really fast. We are facing a really fundamental and really important transition, a transition that every sort of technology platform or technology community or company or project or product goes through. And many of you may be familiar with this picture, but what's going on is this is, this is how people can become comfortable with something new in technology, right? Um, you start out, if you have a clear idea, a clear vision of, of, of a better way to do something, you start out by attracting people who are attracted to that idea, who get it, who are insightful, right? We came out several years ago with some clear, powerful ideas about what free software could be on the desktop and in the broader ecosystem, how it could be delivered, six-month releases, on time, updates, cadence, quality. And those ideas were a rallying call for a small, hard core of people who were excited about what that could mean, who had vision, who had insight into what that could mean. Right? You run along for a while, growing in that community, and then you, then, you have to, then you have to make a transition. It's called the chasm. And essentially, on the other side of that chasm, you have people who are not intrinsically enthusiastic about what you're doing. They will adopt your stuff if it suits their needs. And so you have to do a whole bunch of things differently if you want to win, win them over. And the really tricky thing is you have, to do, you have to do things differently to win these guys over without losing your core audience, right? So who are these guys? What binds them together? What do they have in common? Well, today, they are our incredible community, right? This is, this is a crowd that is problem-solving, that, that sees a bug as a puzzle, that's innovative, that's engaged, that wants to use our platform to, to, to do other brilliant leading-edge types of things. Passionate, articulate, they will go out and tell people about Ubuntu, tell people about free software. They're brilliant, they're forgiving. They are advocates, they're system administrators, engineers, developers. They are, they are brilliant people who, who themselves have insight into what we're doing that is different and unique. Other side of that chasm, it's a different story, right? On the other side of the chasm, people are far less forgiving of a, of a platform or a product which doesn't do things that they think are particularly obvious, doesn't do things that they think should be easy to do or that they expect are easy to do. They don't see a bug as a problem. So we're facing this now. This is an, an, an enormous challenge for us, but it is also a huge opportunity. If we can cross that chasm, if we can start to make Ubuntu something which is out of the box, without doubt, something that the average person who isn't focused on using a computer and what they can do with a computer is delighted by, 
then you will see Ubuntu and free software with it take off. So for me, this is an enormous opportunity for Ubuntu, but also for the broader free software ecosystem. There are a couple of free software projects that have made this leap, Firefox, uh, to a certain extent, open office. But if Ubuntu can make that leap, and we are ready to make that leap, then all of the free software projects that, that, that are essentially are highlighted and promoted and visible in Ubuntu or immediately accessible to people who are running Ubuntu will have a hotline to those consumers, will have the opportunity to make their case, will have the opportunity to, uh, to, to, um, to stand up and show what they can do for that audience. So there's some things we have to get right. Many of the people in this new audience will not install Ubuntu for themselves. They'll get it pre-installed. So we really need to think about what the experience is like when somebody receives a machine that has Ubuntu installed and opens it up and runs it for the first time. What happens for them? We have to get quality right. We've always been passionate about quality, but it is now one of those things that is kind of a make or break effort. Um, and, uh, and so you'll see practices introduced which try to raise the game on quality. We want to attract people to the Ubuntu community who are passionate about getting things right, identifying the critical problems early, um, fixing problems early when, when it's easier to fix them, uh, and continuity. These are the things that we stand for. Freedom, collaboration, precision, reliability. Those are the things that people associate with us. Those are the things that we have to continue to stand for because that's what gets those early adopters on our side. Yeah. <laughs> but let's not be content anymore with those early adopters. Let's go after the whole market, right? <clears throat> we want to get to a position where Ubuntu could be installed on every single computer that the PC industry ships. Now, obviously, at the moment, Ubuntu, Windows, it's an either-or proposition, right? And so what we want to do is we, want, we, we set out to make it possible for OEMs, to make it reasonable, to make it exciting for OEMs to install Ubuntu on the same machine that Windows is installed on as a dual boot option, right? Focused on getting to the web really fast. Some of you will have seen kind of instant on offerings. We did a bunch of research around those. We figured out that it's not about instant on. It's not about how fast you can look like you can do something. It's all about how fast you can actually deliver the web. And so we've set out to produce a version of Ubuntu which delivers the web in seven seconds on a solid state disk. And that version of Ubuntu. <laughs> that version of Ubuntu is available today to OEMs. It has no secret source in it. It is Ubuntu, as you know and love it, stripped down and focused on that singular task, with custom builds for the specific machines concerned. Um, the goal is the fastest possible connection to the web. Uh, with all of the network layers in place, the browser up and running, you are actually ready to go. Uh, now, in setting out to do this, we realized that, we weren't, that it wouldn't be optimal to take the traditional desktop and just deliver that. That in these environments, in these almost stateless environments, there's some things that we don't have to worry about, and there's some things that we can afford to do a little bit differently. There's some, th some new things that we need to, some constraints that we need to bear in mind. One of those constraints is that there's no traditional file management. In an instant environment, you're in an airport, you literally want to get on, get to the web, and be done. In fact, if there's file management there, you really want to think about it as a synchronization effort with the Windows partition potentially, with the cloud, um, with other devices. So there's, there's an opportunity to really change the way file management happens. Um, there's also a really small set of applications, right? We're stripping down Ubuntu to the heart of the goodness. We're distilling it. It's still Ubuntu. You can still apt get anything. You will be able to go from Ubuntu Lite to any version of Ubuntu, right? Or Kubuntu or any other derivative of Ubuntu, right? This is a, a seed which will be planted on as many computers as we can arrange for it to be planted that can grow based on our merits, right? We get the opportunity to compete based on our merits. But initially, there's a very small set of applications. And then the third thing that we really identified is that the future is a touch-driven future. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we did here, it would work on devices where your finger was your obvious way of, of launching an application or switching between applications. So the result of all of that work looks a little different. That's Ubuntu Lite. We've, some things will be familiar, right? 
The indicators work that we've been pushing over the last year or so continues in Ubuntu Lite. But we've changed the way you launch applications. We've changed the way you see um, what's running. We've created a new launcher. And we've created a new panel. And they are Unity, a new netbook-oriented shell A new netbook oriented shell optimized for netbook environments where screen real estate is the critical issue. And we're using Unity in Ubuntu Lite for the very first time because in creating it, we essentially addressed the problems that we needed for the, 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 the instant web environment. We, we designed a launcher which works well with relatively few applications. We didn't need file management, so there's no traditional file management capability in here. We needed a panel that supported the, uh, the indicators, but we wanted it to, to launch really fast. So today, you can download from a PPA, Unity. Um, it is published under GPL v3. The source code is, uh, is, is live now. Um, after you add that PPA and apt-get Unity, you'll have a, a, a Unity login session at GDM. And when you log in, you'll be experiencing effectively Ubuntu Lite, but with your applications installed. Uh, Unity uses Clutter and Mutter, so it is aligned with GNOME 3. Um, it uses many of the technologies that are emerging for dynamic displays and media-rich displays. At the moment, it includes the panel, which supports Ayatana indicators, and uh, the launcher, which has a capability called the quick menu and, uh, and supports a reveal. So the goal for the next cycle is for us to make Unity suitable for the interface of our netbook edition. Remember, it was designed for small screens because most of the computers that we're actually shipping on and most of the computers that we'll ship as, with Ubuntu Lite are running small screens. Um, so our goal is to be able to get it to be the right interface for UNE. There are a couple of problems that we need to address. There are things that, 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 that need to be designed and developed. And those will be the focus of uh, the design dis discussions here at UDS and the netbook discussions here at UDS this week. So the first problem we have to solve is file management. We have to make it possible to, to actually use Unity in an environment where you really do care about having lots of local content and lots of att attached storage, which is not the use case that we, that we originally set out uh, for Unity with, the, with, uh, with Ubuntu Lite. And we have to deal with the case where you have more applications. You saw that that um, launcher is very generous in terms of the icon sizes. The reason for that is to make it touch friendly. But of course, that then limits the number of icons that you can get onto it in a small screen, so there are a number of design challenges to, 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 uh, to resolve in association with that. The lead designer, uh, David Siegel, do you want to stand up and so folks know who you are? David Siegel. <laughs> David would be lead, will be leading conversations here at UDS about how we solve those problems, how we get Unity to be the perfect environment for Ubuntu Netbook Edition. Um, and the engineering team involved, led by Neil Patel, but why don't you all uh, stand up? <laughs> Gord, Mikkel, David, and Mirka, and uh, Neil Patel leading. Uh, those are the guys that you should talk to if you are interested in Unity, if you uh, are running it and you have comments, if you want, uh, want someone who is close to the code to take a look at your uh, bug reports or ideas, those are the guys to talk about. Um, d dive into the sessions and, uh, and have a look. Um, now, one consequence of us pushing for Unity on the Netbook Edition is that we will not have SysTray support in the Netbook Edition um, in 10.10. Uh, in and uh, that precipitates a change in the connection technologies used, so we are likely to use Connection Manager on uh, the Netbook Edition in 10.10. It's a very substantial, fundamental shift. And so here's a call to all of you for, uh, for, for, for testing um, uh, in that regard. This is the uh, proposed design of the dash. Essentially, it is a, a full screen experience. So again, for small screens, we take over the full screen. It's inspired by consoles. It's inspired by devices. And, uh, and it, it, it plugs into a lot of the goodness that uh, we think Zeitgeist is capable of. It plugs into a lot of the goodness that we think the hardware is capable of today. 
Um, this is the focus of the design, getting this absolutely right. David, uh, some of you may know David as the uh, vision and inspiration of Gnome Du, and uh, so he has uh, taken on the challenge of making this as, uh, as intuitive and as lightweight and as fast as, uh, as Gnome Du, which is very popular for all of those characteristics. So some obvious questions that will come up. Um, uh, this is great for GNOME. GNOME now has uh, a shell environment which is optimized for the netbook, for, for the netbook uh, market. That is and continues to be an important uh, marketplace. Um, uh, Unity is aligned with many of the technologies in GNOME Shell. And we see GNOME Shell as being more appropriate and designed for, in all of the design conversations, for large screen environments where you have a more expansive um, uh, uh, approach. Uh, longer sessions where you are organizing activities and so on. Uh, we will be packaging GNOME Shell in 10.10, but the, but the schedule um, of GNOME Shell's release and our release uh, don't allow for GNOME Shell to be a default environment for us. That's a question that has come up many times. But it will be there, it will be in universe. Uh, you know, I would encourage as many people as possible to run it so that we can um, provide, uh, so that we can collaborate with the GNOME Shell folks. Um, and there are daily builds of GNOME Shell, so as Upstream uh, works on that, you can get the very latest versions there. We will also continue to publish the GNOME Strachia Teller session, which may or may not adopt um, elements of GNOME 3. So a very substantial, um, a very substantial project uh, in Unity, a very substantial shift in Unity, and a broadening of the, uh, the, 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 the user experience options for GNOME users. The trajectory of that is about an 18-month trajectory. Our goal is to get Unity absolutely nailed down for 1204 LTS. Um, there are many pieces that need uh, to move quickly during that time, and, uh, and, but we do expect that we can do it in that time frame. At which point, I hope that freedesktop.org and GNOME will have em embraced all of these elements as they stabilize, as they crystallize, as they, uh, as they get completely nailed down. There are a substantial number of other really interesting pieces that are going to go into 1010. Um, the first is this client-side decorations in RGBA windows. Um, we made an attempt to get these into 1004 LTS. It bounced because of the uh, quality requirements in LTS and issues that came up as soon as we landed it. We're now in a position to land it very early in the cycle. Um, would really appreciate uh, your, 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 your testing and help in figuring out if this is creating any issues. Fundamentally, this is all about um, making sure that every window on the, um, on the uh, uh, Ubuntu desktop has full alpha channel support. Um, that means that we can use uh, compositing in all sorts of new ways. We can do really um, sophisticated theming. We can have add a, 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 a lovely uh, detail and polish to the experience. Um, the combination of client-side decorations and RGBA also provides inspiration for all sorts of other pieces of work. Um, but it is a huge change in GTK. It's a substantial change um, in, in, in how we do things. And we do expect there to be fallout. So we'll do it early and, uh, and, uh, um, and then stay on top of it throughout the cycle. Um, you'll have seen that we, we have a very strong emphasis on the indicators. The, uh, the, the panel is an area of the user experience, the desktop experience, that has traditionally been weak. It's been inconsistent. It's, been, um, it's, it's had lots of sort of unexpected surprises for users. And so we felt that this is, if we really want to, to cross that chasm, if we want to work for users who, uh, who, who don't like surprises, we wanted to tighten that up. Um, so we've gone with a very consistent approach to all of the indicators. They all behave like menus. Uh, in 1004, George Castro, where's George, led a fantastic effort to get uh, many of the SysTray, the apps that talked to the SysTray, um, uh, to fit in to that consistent framework using the app indicators framework. George, thank you very much. That was a job well done. So there are, there are two big drives that we have. The first is to make all of those indicators consistent with each other. They are fundamentally menus. The second is to reduce the number of them that people expect. To try to identify, and the, and the way we're doing that is by creating category indicators. Um, so the messaging menu was the first category indicator. It essentially said that instead of having lots of different icons on the panel, which the average user may not recognize, let's put a rec an, an icon there that everybody will recognize. It says messages. And let's give it a consistent behavior that says you have new messages. Let's allow multiple applications to plug into that one indicator and give them an interface that's rich enough to express 
the, the, the semantics of a messaging application. And over time, we expect that to get richer. So for example, a lot of people have said, oh, you know, I get a lot of email. I don't want the, the messaging menu to go green. So now people are starting to say, OK, in my application, in my mail application, I want to be able to identify users. A mail from them is important. Or to be able to tag, you know, have rules to tag me messages. And messages that, 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 that have that tag are important. And if a new message comes in that has that tag, then make that indicator go green. So there's a whole sophisticated uh, 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 set of work happening just around the messaging menu. And the idea is essentially to reduce the clutter and make that more uh, accessible and obvious and intuitive to users. The sound indicator is the next step. Instead of having multiple different applications put icons in the panel saying, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm, I'm a sound player and I'm here so that you have quick access to me. We'll consolidate all of those and make it possible to consolidate all of those into the sound indicator. So a, a, an application, an audio application like Rhythmbox will be able to plug itself in here instead of having its own indicator, be able to plug itself into that indicator. Um, we'll support MPRIS, Empress, which is, a, which is an emerging D-bus based standard to talk to media players. Players. Um, we'll extend Empress so that media players can, can talk to us about things like uh, playlists and, uh, and so that you can um, manipulate playlists. This is also an extensible interface so that the media player can also add items to the menu, not just this, uh, not just this play interface over here. So our goal for 1204 LTS is that all of the media applications will fit into the uh, sound indicator when they're running on a desktop that supports the Ayatana indicators. Um, it's all discoverable, detectable, and we will make it easy for folks writing applications to essentially just say, I'd like to use that if it's available. Otherwise, fall back to other technologies which are common elsewhere. Um, uh, so a really tight, really clean, really slick experience. My goal for 1204 LTS is that I, you know, I should be able to install Ubuntu and detect some sort of uh, 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 media player either installed on the desktop or somewhere else on the network, you know, a, a, a DLNA compliant hi-fi, and then control that straight through the sound indicator so that you can control the volume of what's playing on your hi-fi from the same sound indicator where you are taking the Skype call that you need to listen to. So a very sophisticated and substantial body of work to be done around that. Connor Curran, where's Connor? Connor Curran, wherever he is, is leading the engineering. Connor at the back is uh, leading the engineering on that. And Matthew Thomas is leading the design. So speak to either of them. Where's MPT? Yep, also at the back. MPT will also be leading the design on a keyboard menu. This is not a finalized design. There's some substantial work to be done in straightening out um, and, uh, and, and identifying all of the issues associated with this. But fundamentally, we want to make it really easy for people to install Ubuntu in any language with any keyboard and use Ubuntu in multiple languages with multiple keyboards. Um, the clock menu, a very popular uh, piece of the GNOME panel and, the, and, and a very popular GNOME applet is the, uh, is the, is the clock panel. So we want to make sure that, that by 12.04 LTS we have no regressions in, our, uh, in, in, in the panel that we are supporting. Um, and we're also going to improve the user experience substantially around how you manage time and how you, uh, well not, how, not only how you manage time, but how you manage the clock. Um, <laughs> We hope as a result that your time management will be substantially improved. Um, but we're going essentially from three different control panels and windows down to one plus menu. Um, and uh, perhaps by 12 or 4, we can do even better. So some very cool work. Um, this, one, this one is uh, still open from a design perspective and open from an implementation perspective. So folks who are interested in that, speak to, uh, speak to MPT. Uh, the network menu. Now, I said earlier that on UNE, we're going to run with a Unity panel, and that won't support the SysTray. Um, so the, 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 the current network manager infrastructure that we use, which doesn't talk to the, uh, to the app indicator protocol, um, won't work on uh, UNE. So, um, uh, Kalevalo, where's Kale? Kalevalo, is leading the engineering of a new... 
front end to Intel, uh, Intel's connection manager. Um, a connection manager is a, a, a highly modular, high, highly extensible project to uh, code base to, to, that covers all kinds of connections from Bluetooth through to 3G and WiMAX, Wi-Fi and, uh, and, and Ethernet. Um, it's a very rigorous framework, but it is new. And so uh, there's a substantial need for, uh, for widespread desktop testing. We'll make it possible to test on the traditional desktop. Obviously, it'll also be installed by default on the netbook edition and with the netbook session. Um, but a big change there. Um, we anticipate lots of bumps in the road with that just because nobody has taken Connection Manager to such a wide audience. Uh, but again, we'll get it out early and, uh, and, and take feedback and actively work on that feedback. There's a very good relationship between Color and Marcel Holtzman, the uh, upstream of uh, Connection Manager. So window indicators. Um, uh, the fact that we're starting to get the application to draw its own Chrome um, create, you know, provided the inspiration for window indicators. Essentially, the application is now, in a sense, going to be in complete control of its window. Uh, somewhat controversially, we moved all the buttons to the left in 10.04. And that was specifically to create separation between the application control pieces launching with the Unity launcher and, the, and, and, and closing the application, maximizing and minimizing windows, and um, status information, which is on the right, which is all of the, pa the, the panel indicators and now the window indicators. So essentially, um, these, uh, these uh, indicators behave exactly like panel indicators. They're a status icon uh, with certain rules and patterns that govern it. Um, clicking on them generates a menu, gives you a menu. So, um, uh, so a very predictable behavior. Um, also, broadcast over Dbus so that either the window manager or the panel can take care of the rendering of those indicators so that, uh, so, so that uh, when we maximize the window, we can actually embed these indicators straight into the panel, um, or so that it works with multiple window managers. Um, we'll, be we we'll be focused on making it work with uh, client-side decorations and with the primary window manager shipped on Ubuntu that's using cases where you're not using client-side decorations. Um, but the code will be open, and we'd be delighted to see folks supporting window indicators on other applications or on other window managers as well. Uh, I blogged a little while ago saying that on the netbook edition we would adopt a global menu. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the key here is in efficient use of vertical space in a netbook environment. So we want to, we want to um, um, uh, set, free up as much vertical space as possible on netbooks for, uh, for, for the browser and we want to configure the browser so that it leaves as much vertical space as possible for actually browsing the web. Um, there's a lot of user feedback that says that when on, on small screens, the browser, the, the browser feels constrained, feels tight, and we want to really open it up. So getting rid of the bottom panel for a start and then focusing on a, a browser layout that, uh, that, that's optimized second and third, pushing the menu up into the title bar, um, all of those are going to give us a very lightweight browsing experience. We're going to try to go even further. We're going to try to get it so that when you w maximize the window, um, the title, the window title, and the menu are both in the panel, and based on, um, and based on our, 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 our expectations to use as intent, we'll either expose the menu or not. So in that case, if we can achieve this, we will without question have the best platform for browsing on a netbook, right? You'll have absolutely every piece of real estate um, in a normal configuration um, that's av available for browsing that you need. And of course, you can still go full screen. But even without going full screen, it'll be a really optimized browsing experience. And that's a key goal for us. So the Perfect 1010 um, has Unity, has lots of new desktop technologies. We're also working on a new font. Uh, this is a beta version of the font being used in these slides. I hope you like it. Um, we will crowdsource through a public beta program um, the, uh, the kerning and hinting of that font. Uh, the font design is being handled by a professional uh, um, font foundry, and, uh, and it will be published under an open font license. The timing of that is when it's ready, so because um, we'll have to live with it for a very long time. So, um, so I encourage you, when we, when we open that uh, beta program, I encourage you to get it and try it. We'll use that font for the interface throughout all of the dialogues, the panel, menus, and so on. It's been designed for legibility in, uh, in a screen environment, um, but for also for elegance in a print environment. Um, we'll also start the process 
of coming up with a new ICOM theme. Um, that's going to take a substantial amount of time. Uh, we have some experience doing that. Um, and it's going to, it's not something that we're absolutely certain will get into the cycle. But at least some parts of that, initial parts of that, will happen in the cycle. For example, we'll open up for competing um, groups of artists to, uh, to present their vision of what an icon theme uh, that fits with our new version of Ubuntu as lightwear, Ubuntu as light, um, uh, what, what their vision of what a theme that fits with that idea um, uh, would look like. So there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, hard work to be done. I hope, though, that, I hope, though, that we, will, um, we will not lose sight of our original audience. And there is, there's one thing in all of our research, there's one thing that we found across all of these different kinds of people. There's one thing that they all seem to have in common. It's a slightly unexpected thing. All of those early adopters, to a very large degree, read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> so they all know the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And it turns out that that's 42. And it turns out that 42 in binary is 10, 10, 10. So there's lots that we've got to do for that early adopter audience for forever, right? We have to stay on the leading edge of technology. We have to do very, very cool things. But, but in this one cycle, there is, we have a unique opportunity to recognize that strange little quirky thing that we all have in common. And uh, so I'd like to propose that we release the Maverick Meerkat on the 10th of October, 2010. Now, that is actually going to be a little difficult. <laughs> It's a Sunday. <laughs> so we'll sort of have to be ready to release it on the 7th of October. Um, and so if we're going to do it, there's some, there's some compromises that have to be made. There's some trades that have to be made. If you, think this, if you think this would be a fantastic thing for us to do, a recognition of our values, a great thank you to the people who've supported us all the way along, and just really very cool, the guys in the orange shirts need to hear from you. <laughs> Especially the tall, shiny guy. Where's the, Where's the orange shirt? Hiding. You're hiding. That's like, that's like, you can't hide, dude. That's just like not an option. You're trying to crouch down in there. Your knees are sticking up. So these are the guys who, uh, who, who need to hear from you. I think this would be an astonishingly cool thing to do. But we will have to make some, 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 some compromises. So there are some plan Bs that have already been, been agreed. If we go with this, um, I think it's an astonishingly nice twist and a once in a decade, once in a century opportunity to, uh, to recognize that connection. All right. So <laughs> big challenges. Big goals, big ambitions. It's going to be a big week. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Do we have uh, do we have mics? See one back at the left, and another one from Scott Ritchie. I just want to see the URL of the PPA for Unity. Thank you, pardon, Ryan. The PPA for Unity. Can you show it again? Sure. Oh, would you guys like to see Unity? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's not going to work. Hold on a sec. Let's. Uh... There you go. And uh, so Unity has these really cool uh, 
quick lists if I just drop like that. So that's obviously a simple one, but applications can specify items to go into those quick lists. Um, those items can be persistent when the application isn't running. There's a different set of items, both persistent and updatable when the application is running for dragging. So applications you can, you can effectively say, even if I'm not running, if somebody's dragging something to me, then these are the things that they can do with that drag content, which is a very cool little feature. Um, uh, the, the current behavior to deal with, uh, to do, to deal with the, um, uh, the fact that we need to support multiple applications is to make it sort of uh, very organically uh, draggable. Um, but there are some beautiful, beautiful and very innovative things being proposed by David and Christian on the, uh, on the design team. So go to those sessions and you'll see stuff that is just absolutely beautiful, really taking advantage of what clutter can do. Um, uh, the, we, we use, uh, we use, we use uh, sort of a reveal approach so that you can effectively, oh, I've only got one window of, of those various bits and pieces. Um, uh, so, enjoy. Next question. I actually didn't have a question yet. Um, but so you've got being, the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. So being Ubuntu's sort of resident wine guy, I always have to worry in the back of my mind about how I'm going to have to deal with old Windows applications that still put up system tray icons and do important things through that. And I've been trying to think about how to, whether I need like a wine indicator or a separate kind of menu or just pretend they don't exist for a while. And, and how we're going to deal with backwards compatibility for either Windows apps running through Wine or apps that we haven't migrated to the new indicators or any of this. Yeah, sort of thing. I think it's a very valid. It's a very valid point. Our, our goal is not to mess with people's heads. Um, least of all, you know, the authors of, app, of Windows applications. Um, we specifically made sure that Lucid uh, at the LTS would support the sysstray. Um, and thank you very much for the uh, the great. Uh, drop of wine in, uh, in, in Lucid, the, the, the large bowl of wine in, uh, in Lucid. I, I would encourage you to chat with MPT and with uh, Ted Gould, who... Uh, so I actually secretly arranged for Matthew to be my roommate, so... <laughs> chat, cuddle, whisper... <laughs> I look forward to reviewing those specs. <laughs> okay. Next question. Sensor, right? You said you hoped um, Unity would be embraced by GNOME, but what did you mean with that? Do you hope they will accept it as a GNOME project, or do you hope or do you plan it on being, keeping it as a Ubuntu project? Um, no, I mean, ultimately, I, I, I think that there'll be millions of machines shipping with, you know, effectively GNOME desktops with a Unity shell, um, especially on netbooks and, 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 and Ubuntu Lite. Um, so I mean, and we, we expect that to be part of the broader GNOME project. There's, there's a very long history of, of GNOME having external dependencies. Once the APIs are settled and we can make the sorts of commitments to ABI stability, then they, it might actually become um, sort of more formal GNOME projects. Um, but for the moment, the thing is moving too fast for us to, 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 to make ABI stability commitments. Um, so, so, I mean, in saying embraced by GNOME, I mean actually make it as a GNOME project. We're, we're doing a couple of things in all of our design work. Number one, we wanted to work across all desktop environments. So, for example, the Ayatana indicators. We very expressly chose Dbus as the language that you talk to describe your indicator. And we worked with both, the, with both folks from the KDE environment and from GNOME. Um, so, we see ourselves as trying to work for the good of the whole free software desktop, not being too closely associated with any one project. That, of course, causes some friction, right? There are some folks who will point to that as a reason why you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't embrace some of these pieces or work with these pieces. Um, but to my mind, the free software desktop can't afford 
the, the sort of fractionalism that we've seen in the past. And so that's why we've made that commitment. We've hired folks with expertise across the free software spectrum, and we're designing in such a way that we think we can deliver goodness across the free software spectrum. Um, we've been criticized in the past, for example, for hosting projects on Launchpad. That's just not going to change. It's the most productive, most efficient, most useful place for us to do our work. And uh, it's a perfectly reasonable open source platform. Um, uh, my sense is that the tide is turning, that folks within GNOME um, are excited by the work that we've done, they're, they, they're embracing the work that we've done, they want to see us do more work. So really this is, this is just an appeal for sort of calm and level heads as we have that conversation. I do anticipate some questions. So uh, I'm wondering about what you're going to do with the uh, dual boot situation with the OEMs. Is your idea to have it dual, dual booting on net, netbooks or on every single machine, for instance, desktops? Ah, it's a very good point, and thank you, for, thank you for raising it. We will do, in, in due course, a version of Ubuntu Lite, which uses the desktop interface, whatever the desktop interface is. So the same fundamental goal, a kernel of Ubuntu, essentially, stripped down, optimized for browsing and for a few other applications. Um, but the form factor needs to be appropriate to the screen. And this configuration of Unity isn't, isn't appropriate to a larger screen. Um, so potentially that's where, you know, that's where the, the relationship with, between GNOME Shell and, 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 and Unity, that's where a sort of a natural dividing line will form. Um, <clears throat> you know, the initial versions of Ubuntu Lite with a desktop spin um, would, use the, would use the existing s sort of stable GNOME uh, uh, experience you know, that Ubuntu desktop uses. So the light moniker effectively will use you know, wherever it's appropriate to denote a dual boot oriented, uh, web oriented um, spin of, of Ubuntu for OEMs. There's not, going to be, there's not going to be a sort of a public image of Ubuntu Lite, not because there's secret source, but just because the only way to really get that performance is to, is to, is to optimize it for that particular set of hardware. And, uh, and so we're, we're now starting the conversations with PC OEMs to see who will take it. Any questions? Another one up at the back, apparently. Is there any plans for porting Unity to non-clutter supporting systems like ARM, POSBO, uh, anything like that? So we've specifically, we've specifically engineered Unity um, to make very few assumptions about the, the graphical environment that it's running in, other than GL. It uses GL very heavily, and that's how we achieve some of the effects and transitions and uh, some of the, the things that give it that extra, that sort of really organic feeling. Um, at this stage, it's all X-based, and so probably that precludes it from, uh, from being an ARM smart book or, uh, or, or, or tablet environment. But we'll see, uh, we'll see how that evolves over time. Hi. Um, my question is a little bit outside of what your talk covered, but we have a lot of, um, you're talking about OEMs and, and Ubuntu actually going out there and people who, you know, making that jump across the, the, uh, the chasm, as it's called. But that wild, does, terrifying leap, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does um, Ubuntu have, or Canonical have, any plans for actually advertising Ubuntu and, and getting it out there and, and educating people about um, There are quite a lot of people who've heard about Ubuntu now. Um, and that hasn't come about through sort of traditional Super Bowl advert style marketing. Um, perhaps the day will come when that's appropriate for us. Uh, but, but essentially, we're in, a, we're in, a, we're in a, 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 a growth phase that's characterized mainly by um, doing the right things for the right people, doing things that people will naturally talk about. And so that's, that's primarily how we, how, we, how we market Ubuntu. Um, and for the moment, I think that's the, that's the appropriate approach. There are, all sorts of, there are all sorts of subtle shifts going on. For example, the Ubuntu Manual Project. Where, where, where are those guys? Wow. You know, what an extraordinary, John O called it out. But that's, that's a kind of marketing, right? Because it's, it's a message. The message is this 
there's, there's sensible content for you. If you think you, you know, your first, your first stop, your first question is, where's the manual? Now there's an answer to that question. Um, and more importantly, in a community environment, there are people there who care. Um, so as our project gets richer, as our project gets more diverse, as the community gets more diverse, you know, each of those, each of those moves is, is part of a marketing message. It's part of the movement. And uh, that's why it's so important. Questions? Over here. Mark, could you say a little bit about how you see the server product moving forwards? Hmm. So the key, folk for us on, f f key focus for us on the server is environments where um, people are doing large scale deployments and where they want to do those deployments very fast. And the reasoning for that is that a heritage on the server is Debian, which is really an extraordinary environment, you know, designed by, built by, and for professional system administrators and developers. And I think that's just the best heritage that we could possibly, you know, wish for in a, in, in, in a server environment. My goal is that we will effectively do justice to that um, and, uh, and, uh, and sort of carry that message forward. Uh, carry Debian into places where it hasn't yet succeeded. I'd like to see us get certified. Uh, some of you will have seen the announcement by Dell, for example, that they will pre-install the Ubuntu cloud images, um, which are essentially the Ubuntu server with, uh, with, with cloud packages pre-installed um, on a range of their hardware. That is the first major PC server manufacturer to announce that they would pre-install Ubuntu. So a very substantial step forward. Um, congratulations, obviously, to the, to the server team for that. And that's, and that's just the start. But again, the focus is not, the focus is, is not you know, on trying to replicate what other people have done. You know, we don't want to be you know, like Red Hat. I have the, the, the utmost respect and, and regard for Red Hat. And I think there's plenty of room in new markets where Red Hat you know, doesn't, doesn't currently and appears not to want to, 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 to play. So for example, in the public cloud, you know, Ubuntu is enormously popular in the public cloud. And the essence of the public cloud is scalable deployments and fast deployments. It used to take you know, weeks or months to get a machine provisioned. If it then took a couple of days to get it configured, that's, relatively speaking, not a problem. Um, if it takes three minutes to get a machine provisioned, provisioned, and it then takes a couple of hours or days to, pro to, to configure it, suddenly, relatively speaking, that's a problem. Um, and so those are the sorts of problems we want to solve in the Ubuntu community. Tools for um, uh, building cloud apply uh, appliances that are reusable, not just in the cloud, but also in traditional, you know, on the metal deployments. Um, tools for uh, configuration management. Uh, Yoss re referred to configuration management. That's a very big theme for us. Making it possible for one system administrator to support hundreds, thousands of, uh, of running workloads in a cloud environment or on the metal. Um, we've seen some really large adoptions, some, some really substantial adoptions of Ubuntu on the server now um, in the hundreds, thousands of, uh, of um, nodes. Avatar was rendered on 35,000 nodes running Ubuntu. Uh, Kubuntu, actually. So those large-scale deployments are, are really interesting to us. They have, they have unique um, challenges, unique opportunities. Um, I don't see us chasing up the stack, you know, to, to do the, the, the you know, high-end machines. I don't think, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend that someone, you know, who bought a 16-way machine run Ubuntu on it and then put Oracle on top of that for all sorts of reasons, um, not, not least of which is the fact that there's a better database um, called Postgres. But, um, but, but, but fundamentally, that's just, not, that's just not that interesting to us. Our heritage is in sort of light, thin, um, but very wide deployments. And that's what we'll focus on. Any more questions? Good to work. Everybody hammering that PPA, huh? <laughs> All right. I think we thank, thank you very much, Jonna. And thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Mark.